Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 27th of October and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 30th of October with me Michael Hewson. Lots to get through um, in today's video. Um, certainly been a busy week for earnings in the US as well as here in the UK and it will continue to be so as we head into the end of the month. Um, seen an awful lot of volatility over the course of the past few days. That's borne out in some of the price moves that we've seen so far this week, particularly in Europe, but also in the US. But I think with respect to the US, we've seen um, a much more negative bias when it comes to further declines, further weakness in US stocks than we have in Europe. European markets have actually held up slightly better um, than the US counterparts where um, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ have seen some very sizable one day moves lower. We're seeing a little bit of a rebound today on the back of a positive reaction um, to Amazon's results last night, which were by and large pretty good. Um, Amazon Web Services revenue came in just slightly below 20, the $23.3 billion expected, came in around about 23.1. So that was a slight miss on cloud. Um, yet the miss on cloud that we saw from Google or Alphabet earlier this week produced the biggest one day decline since March 2020. So it's not exactly horses for courses when you've seen some of the earnings numbers this week. Microsoft, solid set of numbers. Um, Alphabet, solid set of numbers, but varying fortunes when it came to the share price reaction going forward. Alphabet sold off on the back of a significant, well, a slight miss, $170 million miss on cloud, which seems slightly outsized when you consider um, that um, the actual revenue numbers and the profit numbers smashed expectations. So an awful lot to um, chew over, shall we say. Um, also a lot to chew over when it comes to UK banks, because again, we saw some very choppy reactions to the results from Barclays, Lloyds, and obviously today we've heard, we've seen NatWest shares plunge to their lowest levels in 30 months after they slashed their net interest margin guidance from 3.15% for the year, full year, to just above 3%. And certainly when we actually look at the, the, the NatWest numbers, um, certainly on the net interest margin, we've seen a really sharp slowdown from the levels that we saw in Q1 when we saw 3.27 and now um, for Q3 we saw 2.94. So that's a quite a sizable drop. Um, but having said that, um, the move that we've seen thus far today does seem a little bit outsized when you actually look at the fact that um, the shares dropped around about 19%, sorry, 16% on the open. Um, recovered a little bit since then, as we can see from this chart here, open down there, went out there, but we're still well below that 200p level um, that we saw um, tested earlier this year. So um, looking ahead, we've got the last of the big banks, HSBC, um, that's they are reporting. They're reporting on Monday. Um, the Q3 numbers, and if anything is a sign that there might be a downside surprise there, it's Standard Chartered numbers earlier in the week, which um, saw a sizable, a slightly bigger revision provision for non-performing loans with respect to China real estate, and prompted a little bit of weakness there. So that be paying close attention to them. Um, but also um, big oil, uh, BP and Shell. We've got BP and Shell's third quarter numbers coming out. And the last of the big tech, the Magnificent, well, not the last of the Magnificent Seven because we've still got NVIDIA to work through, but um, we've got Apple's um, fourth quarter numbers um, coming out on the 2nd of November. And we've also got the whole host of macro decisions that are likely to um, be very constructive, I think, in terms of how central banks see the likelihood of further rate hikes going forward. I think most of us believe that central banks are done when it comes to hiking rates um, on this particular 
hiking cycle. That's not to say that they will want to admit that uncomfortable truth, given the economic backdrop and given the huge levels of uncertainty which has been driven by the conflict in the Middle East. We're already seeing some evidence that the US might get drawn in to the conflict after the headlines this morning that saw US forces um, target um, terrorist bases in Syria. Um, certainly we've heard an awful lot of rhetoric from the likes of Iran that might suggest that um, there's a risk that they could get drawn in and certainly that is a clear and present danger going forward. Looking at the US two year, we've seen an awful lot of choppiness in um, yields this week. You can see that in this chart here. If I mouse over there, we've got high of 513 and a low of 504. Here we've got a high of 514 and a low of 502. So we've been chopping in a 15, you know, 10 to 15 point range on yields every day this week, which speaks to me, I think, of an enormous amount of uncertainty as to whether or not US rates have peaked. Certainly 4.9% third quarter GDP number suggests that the US economy is in pretty resilient mode. Weekly jobless claims around about 200,000, still very, very low. Did see a little bit of a pickup in continuing claims, but they're still below 1.8 million. So they're still um, at a fairly low level. So as we look ahead to a big week for central bank meetings, we've got the Bank of Japan on Tuesday, the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, and the Bank of England on Thursday. And we've got non farm payrolls on Friday. So in terms of macro and in terms of earnings, it's a huge week. So let's get started on some of the key levels um, that we are looking at over the course of the next few days. FTSE 100 held up reasonably well thus far this week. We can see that from the price action, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We've chopped around pretty much in a reasonably broad range. Top of that range is around about 74.30. The bottom of that range 73.20 and I think that will continue to be the extent of it. If we look at this here we can see that we're still within the broad range that we've been in for the most part of this year and I don't think that will change too much. As for the DAX still remain very much in the downtrend. We have made marginal new lows um, over the course of the past few months. But what's important is that we haven't actually taken out the March lows. But again, here we've got lower highs, we're getting lower lows. So the line of least resistance at the moment is to sell into strength. And at the moment, um, given the fact that we've managed to hold above this, these, these series of lows down here, there is reason to suppose that we could well squeeze back um, towards the top of this downtrend line in the short to medium term. The S&P 500, the NASDAQ have been the real key, um, the key charts for this week. Um, last week I talked about the fact that the S&P 500 was trading below its 200 day moving average. It tried to move back above that on Tuesday. It's failed. It's now fallen back below it and has continued to track back below it. It's also below 4,200 and that for me I think is very significant. If we are to see a stabilization in the uh, in the S&P 500, we really need to get back above the 200 day moving average and this series of peaks back here at around about 4270. Otherwise, there is a risk that we could actually continue to fall um, back towards the lows that we saw back in May of around about 4040. 4, 4040 on the S&P. So the 4000 level on the S&P 500 is the next short-term target. The NASDAQ has also seen some really sharp losses over the course of the past two days. Um, we are starting to rebound at the moment. Interestingly, we've rebounded off the 200-day moving average. So that could exhibit an, uh, an element of support in the short term. But as with the S&P 500, the fact is we've broken below this key support area through here around about 14,350 and we really do need to get back above it to signal um, the, the likelihood of a pullback 
towards the 50 day moving average and the 15,000 level. But certainly I think the breaks that we've seen thus far this week would appear to suggest that it's gonna be very difficult for US markets to rally back to the levels that we saw earlier this year. The Nikkei is particularly interesting. Again, with the Bank of Japan, we've got the 200 day moving average, which has continued to act as support for the Nikkei 225. Um, we've seen a decent rebound today. Obviously we've got the Bank of Japan on Tuesday, um, and there is some speculation that the BOJ could look at perhaps tweaking their monetary policy further, given the fact that dollar yen is now back above 150. Um, we've seen the way the dollar's traded over the course of the past few days. It's finally managed to gain a foothold above 150, has the potential to go back to the highs that we saw back in October last year. But um, if we note that, that these are the sorts of levels that the Bank of Japan was intervening at um, 12, just over 12 months ago now. And certainly we have seen some sharp moves lower in the past few days, perhaps on the basis the Bank of Japan could be checking rates. Certainly there's been no direct indication that the Bank of Japan has actually physically intervened by selling dollars and buying yen. So I think it'll be particularly interesting whether or not um, they are leaning, the Bank of Japan is leaning in the direction of a change in policy, even with a 10 year JGB yield currently at 0.85%, which is well above the upper boundary at yield curve control, which is still at 0.5. You'd think that they'd basically bow to the fact that the market is already above their upper boundary and move it perhaps to the 1% level. But I think an, an, one of the main reasons why the dollar has continued to gain against the yen is not because um, yen, yen yields are rising, it's because dollar yields are rising much faster. So the yield differential is continuing to move in the dollar's favor. Um, Euro dollar, um, quickly have a look at that. We've dropped below this trend line here. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Certainly in the context of this, the key support levels, um, the, 10, the 104.80 levels from uh, earlier this month are likely to be fairly key, as are the levels of around about 104.40. Certainly there's a significant area of support in and around those levels. Um, and the 50 day moving average is currently acting as a bit of a resistance, but for me, it's probably a little bit of a weak resistance. These two peaks and around 105.80 are likely to be a much better arbiter of wider resistance on Euro dollar going forward. But again, the downtrend very much remains intact there. Cable is gonna be particularly interesting next week. We've got the Bank of England rate meeting. Obviously we saw the ECB keep, re keep rates on hold earlier this week. And I think the big question um, for the coming week for the Bank of England is not whether or not they keep rates on hold at 5.25%. Um, I think the bigger question will be whether or not it's as close a decision as it was in September. Um, it was an unexpected decision to keep rates on hold. I for one felt that it's something that they would, be, they would be making a mistake if they push rates much higher. It would appear that a majority of the MPC agreed with that assessment. I think the Bank of England is done. Um, I think the bigger question is how many others on the committee think that we've already heard from Catherine Mann, who's probably, he's one of the hawkish members on the MPC, that she still thinks further rate hikes are necessary. Um, I, I, don't, I don't happen to agree with that assessment. I think monetary policy is tight enough as it is, and it's really just a question of waiting for those 14 rate hikes to filter through going forward. And there is evidence that that is happening. If you look at the PMIs, if you look at retail sales, um, consumer demand is very much, um, it's, very, it's very much down and consumer confidence saw a big fall um, in earlier this month in the October numbers when we fell back um, to March, just to below minus 30. Um, sticky wage growth is likely to be a concern for the central bank. But even here, I think there's a sense that this has seen a peak because it's remained at 7.8% for the last three months, even as headline inflation has continued to slow. I think there ought to be enough evidence this week for a majority decision to hold rates. Um, the bigger question will be whether or not the hawks, the four hawks from September, how many of them actually move to a holding position? So instead of a 5-4, 
maybe we get a 7-2 split in terms of holding rates. Um, I think for me, uh, the most likely to switch to a hold would probably be external members, Megan Green, possibly Jonathan Haskell as well. Both of them um, called for a hike in September. So I think the big the big support level on cable is in and around this 120 area. I think as long as we hold hold above that, there is scope for a fairly decent sterling rebound going forward. Uh, we've also got the Federal Reserve rate decision on the 1st of November. And obviously the GDP number of 4.9% does present them with a bit of a problem. Uh, personal consumption, 4%. We've got PCE core inflation due out later today. I think that is expected or is slightly to have slowed further um, for um, the for the period in, in September. And I think more than anything, it's more about a direction of travel for US policymakers than the actual numbers themselves. PCE core deflator is expected to slow from 3.9% to 3.7%. So I think Fed policymakers have already made it quite plain that we're going to see a hold um, in this week's decision. Um, I think as we head into Q4, US consumption patterns, while they've remained resilient, are unlikely to be rel they're unlikely to um, continue at the sort of level that we saw in Q3. And with those GDP numbers, we did see a significant slowdown in pricing pressures from 3.7% to 2.4%. So I think another hold. They'll obviously keep the option open for a December hike going forward. I think that's eminently sensible. But I, 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 I'm of the opinion that I think in the absence of any um, upside surprises when it comes to wages, inflation and what have you, the Fed is probably done when it comes to rate hikes. Now, obviously, oil prices could play a part in that, making inflation more sticky. But I think hiking rates in response to our um, higher oil prices is basically a double whammy for hard-pressed consumers and is likely to be of very fairly limited use, particularly when you've got US mortgage rates at 8%. Um, that's um, quite an eye-watering uh, level. So I think for Federal Reserve, Bank of England, hold, hold. Bank of Japan, outside possibility, we might get a tweak on um, uh, yield curve control. And then, of course, we've got non-farm payrolls on Friday, which usually is the highlight of the week, but I think it's going to take very much second fiddle to um, the central bank rate meetings. Um, just as a quick pricey, obviously we will have a webinar um, covering the non-farm payrolls numbers. The webinar will start at 12.15, not 1.15, because of the UK clock change. Um, US clocks don't change um, for another for another for another week. So it'll be 12:15 to 12:45, not 1:15 to 1:45. So please bear that in mind. Expectations are for October payrolls to slow from the blowout number that we saw in September, 336,000 in September for 185. But I should also remind you that we're expecting to see 185 in September, and we got 336. So um, and August was also revised up to 227. So um, another resilient labour you know, a labour market report is likely to keep um, expectations of another Fed rate hike very much on the table for December. Um, and the bigger question will be whether or not the Fed wants to deliver that sort of Christmas present um, just a week before Christmas, but they have done it before. So I wouldn't put it past them to do it again. Um, so keep an eye on wages. Um, one of the notable, I think one of the notable factoids that I took from the fact that um, we saw a very strong employment report in October was the fact that part-time positions rose 151,000. And it could also explain why wage growth continues to remain fairly lacklustre relative to um, what we've seen thus far. One warning note I would say is that an awful lot of these wage agreements that have been recorded in recent months with the airlines, with the auto workers, 
um, could start to push wage inflation higher and that could force the Fed into another rate hike. Now, we've not seen any evidence of that so far, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Fed might not go out, might not close 2023 with another rate hike because of the 25, 30% pay rises that have been awarded. And as, as UPS and FedEx as well, um, they've granted their staff bumper um, pay rises. So that could start to feed in over the course of the next few months, thus making US inflation that much stickier. We've also got EU CPI, um, flash CPI for October. That has also been slowing sharply in recent months, with core CPI slowing to 4.5% in November, which made, I think, the September decision to hike rates all the more, I think, surprising. I think going forward, it was very much a surprise for me. Um, I think we will see a further slowdown in EU CPI in uh, October. Um, as I say, we, we slowed we slowed to uh, 4.5 in September, um, and we could well slow even further in the October numbers with estimates for core CPI to slow from 4.5 to 4.2 and for headline CPI to slow to 3.1%. Um, and obviously, if we do see sharp slowdowns there, that could well undermine the euro even further. Euro sterling has edged higher, more on sterling weakness than anything else, remain in a fairly decent uptrend here, but there does appear to be significant area of resistance in and around 87.40, 87.50. So we nearly need to crack that to continue to push higher. But if you actually look at what Euro sterling's done this year, it's been in a range, and I don't think that will change going forward. You can throw a blanket over that range and trade it accordingly. The elephant in the room has obviously been the move higher in oil prices. We're up today on the back of those US strikes inside Syria, um, concerns that the conflict may widen. But if we look at the moves that we've seen this week, um, They've been quite big in terms of the, the wider moves between 90 and, and 85 and 87 dollars a barrel in terms of the moves high, 91 and 87. So a lot of choppiness there. We haven't reached the peaks that we saw back in September, even allowing for obviously what happened on the 7th of October. Um, so there is an awful lot of concern, I think, at the moment that higher oil prices could signal demand destruction. And that is what is keeping a lid on oil prices currently, as well as concerns about a slowdown. Overall, I think the range is here. It's the lows back in back in the beginning of the month, 85, obviously significant resistance to the previous highs back in September. I think that will continue to be the way of it unless there is a significant escalation and Iran gets drawn in and there's concerns about um, oil flow through the Straits of Hormuz. Gold has been a significant standout, trading near the highs of the week and the past few months. But for me, I still think gold has the potential to move through $2,000 and back towards the levels that we saw earlier this year. I can't see any scenario whereby um, we're going to see much of a dip. And if we do, then the lows that we saw earlier in the week around about 1950 could well be the extent of it. But again, expect to see further chop through here. In terms of earnings, we've got, obviously I've talked about HSBC, um, seen quite a bit of weakness over the course of the past few days, managed so far to hold above the 200 day moving average. And certainly we still appear to be in the uptrend that we've been in over the course of the past few months, but obviously I think the big test for HSBC is its exposure to China real estate. And obviously the, we've heard an awful lot about um, the concerns about the finances of Country Garden uh, and Evergrande. So um, that could be a that could be a risk for HSBC. We've got the numbers from BP and Shell. Um, be very interesting, I think, in the context of whether or not either of these companies can beat the numbers that we saw in Q2. Both companies 
actually posted some fairly disappointing numbers in Q2. BP has underperformed um, quite significantly. They've had um, problems of their own. Bernard Looney being forced to step down after failing to disclose details of past relationships with colleagues. Um, a few weeks after Looney stepped down, the boss of BP's US operation, Dave Lawler, also resigned. So I think this uncertainty helps explain why BP share price has underperformed relative to Shell's. There's also no indication that any new CEO um, won't continue to persevere with the performing while transforming um, policy of his predecessor, Bernard Looney. When BP reported in Q2, it was widely expected to come in short of expectations. Um, and it still failed to clear that lowered bar, $48.54 billion in Q2 revenue. Underlying replacement cost profits slid to $2.59 billion, missing estimates by almost $1 billion. So um, I think higher prices in gas and oil will obviously mean that Q3 has done an awful lot better. Um, on guidance for Q3, BP said it expects upstream production to be broadly flat compared to Q2, with oil production output ex expected to be lower and gas and lower, lower carbon energy to be higher. A big level for me, obviously for BP, is these peaks that we saw back in October, as well as back in February this year. But certainly I don't think there's any reason to suppose that we won't see a much better set of Q2 numbers for BP. Um, Shell hit new record highs um, and continues to go from strength to strength. Um, and you can put the gain, I think you can put the acceleration and the gains down to that time when the new CEO, um, Wales Sarwan, pushed back on the previous strategy of renewables at any cost back in June. If we look at June, um, this was when the pushback happened. And since then, we've seen a significant acceleration or on the gains in the Shell share price. Like BP, Shell reported um, a shortfall in profits and revenues in Q2, largely due to lower natural gas and crude oil prices that occurred over that quarter. Obviously, since then, we've seen a fairly solid rebound. It also, I think, blamed problems in its chemi chem chemicals division, which had a difficult quarter, which slid to a loss of $468 million. So, you know, there was a little bit of a weak spot there. Um, for Q3, on the outlook, um, Shell did downgrade its expectations for capital expenditure by $1 billion to so between $23 and $26 billion. It announced a 15% divvy increase as well as a $3 billion dollar share buyback program for Q3, so it should have completed that. Um, upstream profits should um, probably be better than they were in Q2, as in downstream. Whether or not they'll be anywhere near as um, big as they were last year is a moot point, but ultimately I think the, the desire to focus on the legacy business more to and, and and away from renewables is certainly good in terms of the gains that we've seen in shares. The bigger question is whether or not that will continue to be sustainable. Certainly, there's an awful lot of pushback um, on that from external forces. But I think what one of the things the CEO has shown is he's not really afraid to make difficult decisions when it comes to delivering for shareholders. We're going to finish off with Apple. This is interesting, the fact that the Apple share price has dropped below the 200-day moving average. Um, obviously, their Q4 numbers are due out. Um, they've had problems with um, the new iPhone Platinum overheating. There's been talk about that. Um, Q4 revenue is expected to fall modestly to $89.29 billion, with profits expected to rise to $1.39 a share. On an annual basis, because obviously these are the Q4 numbers, Revenues are expected to fall to $383 billion and profits to $6.07 a share. So I think one of the notable features of this particular quarter will be, or the particular focus will be on iPhone demand, because this will be the first full quarter that, that um, Apple has had to 
go up against the new Huawei device, which could have well have cannibalized its Chinese sales. And China sales for Apple make up 20% of its overall revenue. So this break below um, the September lows and the 200 day moving average could be significant um, over the course of the next few days, particularly if the shares do miss expectations on their Q4 numbers going forward. So that's pretty much it for this week. A lot to get through, a lot to chew over there, a lot to get through. Um, so um, hope you all have a nice weekend. Um, and don't forget, non-farm payrolls next week starts at 12.15, not 1.15, because of the clock change. So have a great weekend and hopefully speak to you all next week. Thanks for listening.